Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. All right, praise the Lord. Well, we're glad you're out from Wednesday night. The uh, life and writings of Paul. We are uh, over in Corinth with Paul, and he's writing to the church at Rome. And uh, we've covered the first uh, chapter. In the beginning of the first chapter, talked about, it was just basically a salutation. And then he goes into uh, the doctrine of sin. Woo! You can't have the doctrine of reconciliation until you've established the doctrine of sin. You have to know that you're lost without God in order to be reconciled. Amen. So uh, there is teaching in the Bible on sin. And I know some people don't like to hear it, but it's there. So anyway, the first, we get into chapter 1 in verse 18 through 32, talks about how the Gentiles are under sin. Right. And that even nature tells them that they're under sin. Well, then he gets to chapter 2, he goes and, and really re begins to rebuke the Jews. Because see, therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou that judgest, for thou where thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest thou the same things. Okay. For reading, we find he's, he's referring to the Jews. See, the Jews thought they were cool. They would stone somebody and be living in the same sin at the same time. But they, you know, it's, they, they, they were what they refer to as a moralist. And so they believed that they were, they were, you know, they would have their act together and so forth. And so Paul's, this, this, this statement about judgment was not about judging things according to the word of God. It was having an un unrighteous or self-righteous more a self-righteous and a self-advocation um, uh, from, from judgment as you judge somebody else. Thou that judgest thou that doest thou the same. So it's, you know, it's, it's not that you can't judge something. And we, we went over this last week in detail. We're not going to go over again as much detail tonight. Just remind you, go listen to last week. You know, there are people who say, you, see, you're not supposed to judge. You go, yeah, I can do anything I want to. You shouldn't judge me. That's not, that's, that's not Bible. When Paul's talking here, he's talking about an unjust or a self-righteous judgment. And so, um, like verse 3, Thinkest thou, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Oh, for all the people who don't believe God judges, there's a judgment of God that's coming. We were told, we've been told by one national hyper-grace menace, not national, international, that anybody that tells you that God judges people or nations is sick. That's what he said in an American church here in America, at one, probably the biggest American church. That any preacher that tells you that God judges individuals or nations is sick. Now I'm telling you, this is a, this is a major ministry. In a major church, and nothing, was, nothing was said to correct it. See, because we don't want to offend anybody. You know, if, if the gospel offends them, the gospel offends them. You don't go out trying to offend people, but if they're offended because you told them the Bible says such and such, then it's, that's just how it is. We can't circumvent truth to make them feel good. Okay? All right. Moving right along. Uh, we, and so our despises the riches of his goodness and forbearance. Remember last week we talked about how forbearance meant that God was staying or putting off his judgment. It, it, this is what the, we did the Greek study here, and, and, and we had that, you know, the information on that. Uh, how the God, the forbearance meant God pushed away his judgment for a season yeah. in order for the person to repent because of his goodness. But it's only pushed off for a season. Yeah. It's not pushed off forever. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's a God loves you. And God's, I'm going, to be, I'm going to forbear this for a season. To give you, the, not, not so you can continue there. I know we kind of covered some of this last week, but I got to say it again. How can we think that Jesus came, died, shed his blood to redeem us from the sin nature so we can continue living there because we're now under his grace? God abhors sin. I know it's a uh, 
word I don't usually use. A pores. Jesus came to deliver you from the sin so you won't be bound by it. Not so you can continue doing it. He came to redeem you from that. Amen. And even Paul wrote rhetorically here in the book of Romans, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What is, what is Paul's answer? God forbid. So, moving right along. You have to listen to last week and get all that. But after the hardness and impotent, that means unrepentant, heart, Treasures up thyself, wrath. He said, you're, he said, Paul said, if you continue living in sin and don't do the right things, you're treasuring up wrath in the day of judgment. Now, folks, I love you. I don't want you to treasure up wrath. Hello? Treasures up thy, unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Well, how do we get things we did wrong out from under being, getting cooked by the wrath of God? Repent. <laughs> Hello? That's how you do away with the treasure you've stored up. You repent for all that. Get it under the blood. Or get it under, not get. <clears throat> I'm Southern boys, get. Hallelujah. We're going to get her done. All right, praise God. Feeling loopy. <laughs> who will render to every man according to his deeds. Now let's, let's do what Paul says here. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory, honor, uh, and, and, and immortality, eternal life, but to them that are contentious and do not obey. I had somebody tell me one time because they're in the grace they don't have to obey. Who do not obey um, the truth, but obey unrighteousness Indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace that every man worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Oh, there's a way that was work, work. For there is no respecter of persons with God. For as many have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law, and as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Now Paul's letting the Jews know you don't have a leg up on getting out of this just because you were born a natural Jew. For not the hearers of the law are justified before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Hallelujah. Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the mean while accusing or ex else excusing one another. Now Paul comes on here and goes, it doesn't matter if you're a Gentile or a Jew because if you're, if you're a Jew, you've got the written law, but if you're a Gentile, the law is already written in your heart. You know what's right or wrong. We have, an in, we have to have ungodly men and women teach us that wrong is right. Yeah. And they put books in the schools called Heather Has Two Mommies or Jimmy's Two Dads for your little, your little ones to go pick up at the library. They're in the schools. Right. For your little ones to go pick up at the library and read so they can indoctrinate them that homosexuality is okay. Yeah. See? Because, see, nature tells you it's wrong. Hello? But, see, you've got to be indoctrinated. We're well, not just that in any kind of sin now. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing how, how that sex is one of the arenas that we, we're taught that anything goes no matter what. And if you're a prude or you're a puritan or you're whatever, if you don't think so, they're being indoctrinated. They have to be taught. People are being taught to, to override the conscience that tells them that these things are wrong. So your mind, you're, 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 you already know what's right and wrong. This, 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 what is that? That's the moral code of God that's been placed in every man's heart. Every man has that in his heart. That's why every man is void and empty until he is reconciled to God and free from that sin that he's living in because there's a moral code in him telling him he's doing wrong. It's just in people. You go through societies, even, even some of the most abased societies you can find on the planet, you'll find out that there's, there, there, there's a common thread of things that are wrong. 
I mean, you know, the Muslims will cut your hand off if you, if you steal. Hello? You just go, it's there. There's a moral code built into us because we're spiritual beings. God is a spirit. And that code's passed on. When man sinned and rebelled against God, um, you know, and all the things that have happened and the law that's been given and so forth and so on, there's still an unregenerated man, a moral code that says this is wrong or that is wrong. Hello? All right. Verse 17. I'm sorry. 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Behold, thou art called a Jew, which restest in the law, and thou makest a boast of God, and knowest his will, and proves the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou, thou art self, that thou, that, hello, and confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light unto them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. See, this is where he's getting... <coughs> Paul's trying to get on the Jews and say, look, you can't go teach people that adultery is wrong and then you live in adultery. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? So, so when you take verse 1, thou that judgest another, doest thou, you know, um, um, who art thou, man, who judges another? You got to take the whole context. Of what, that, was a, that was a, how many have you ever written a paper? And in that paper you have your, your thesis statement or the statement that's the primary thought for the whole paper. That's, that's what Paul did here. His, his, his thesis statement for this part of this letter was, who art thou, man, that judges another? And then he goes, what? Because you're living doing the same thing. <clears throat> you're, li you're living in a place where you are condoning what you're doing, but condemning what someone else is doing when they're doing the same thing. Bobblehead. So, so when you have a thesis statement, you, you can't take that out of the context and go and, and apply it in other places where it doesn't fit. You have to take the whole. When you take that out, who art thou that judges another old man? You take that out. See, you can't judge anybody. That's what people do. Okay? They'll, go, they'll, go, they'll get their scriptures about not judging, put them all together out of their context <clears throat> and make them come, come on. And we got to walk in us. We can't ever say that anybody's, something anybody's doing is wrong because then we're judging. No, we're not. If I give you a scripture for what you're doing that is wrong, I'm not judging you. The word is. The word's judging you. Hello? Okay. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou, thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. Now stop there. Now Paul just basically comes along and says, you know, because you have a covenant, you're circumcised. But if you're living in, this is, this is where Christians come along. You know, I'm under grace. I'm born again, so that, therefore nothing applies to me anymore. You're saying you're circumcised, but it's okay if you can do the things that, that you tell uncircumcised people they can't do. Or unregenerated people. Let's, let's take the term, because the term is really what Paul is using, circumcision and uncircumcision, is to say this, born again and not born again. You're circumcised after the flesh, you have a covenant with God. The Gentiles are uncircumcised, do not have a covenant with God. They're not born again. But if they're doing the righteous things, and they don't have the covenant, won't their righteous acts be counted towards them? And you're unrighteous things be counted against you. That's what Paul's argument is here. And then he goes on and say, he makes this profound statement, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. He's a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit and not in letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So Paul's argument against the Jews is, you guys don't get a free pass to live any way you want to live just because you're under the law 
and you have the law and you have all that, and the Gentiles don't. Let's, model, let's, let's take this over into Christian circles. You don't get a pass to live any way you want just because you're born again. And then the guy who's out there living in sin, that's a sinner. You don't get, you don't, we don't get that option. Paul says, and he goes on, says, really, to tell the truth, guys, the, the real Jews is not the ones who have the, have the circumcision of the flesh, but of the heart, they've been born again. That is a Jew who's inwardly. You're the seed of Abraham. If you be Christ, Galatians 3. If you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3, 28, somewhere around there. Okay? And he said the seeds, not as, not as, he said the seed, not seeds as of many, but as of one, which is Christ. Then he goes on down later and says, and if you be Christ, possessive, then are you Abraham's seed, singular, and heirs according to the promise. Then Paul writes over here, and Paul wrote Galatians, but he writes over here and says this. He said, it's not the outward circumcision that really matters. It's the inward circumcision. Amen? It's of the heart. And then, then, then Paul, um, so Paul's basically, now, Gentiles and Jews are all under sin. Same, same plan of redemption for all of them. Amen? So he steps over into chapter 3. And kind of continues with this a little bit. Because you know, Paul didn't want to slam them too hard. What advantage hath the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way chiefly because they were, unto them were committed the oracles of God. Now, he's saying basically your heritage is your advantage. <clears throat> For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, and every man a liar, as it is written, thou was, that thou, thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God, God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak, as a, I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how would God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, yet why am I judged as a sinner? And not rather as we slanderously reported, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm we, that we say, let us do evil, that good may come, whose damnation is just. Now, you've got people who say, I, I, my kids went to school with them in their Bible class, not, not Rhema, their high school. God made them a prostitute so he could, show, he could show his grace and be good to them. Well, he says here, it's slanderously, slanderously reported that we tell people, Let's do evil that good may, you know, come out of it. Are you here? Let us do evil that good may come. We, that's, that was a slanderous report. They were saying Paul was preaching that you can go out and do evil and God's going to show his mercy and his goodness in this. That's cool. Paul said that's a slander. Paul said that was a slander against what I preach. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we've proved both Jews and Gentiles. Paul summarizes it now a little bit of what he said here. We have proved both Jews and Gentiles, they're all under sin. That was his argument in all of this. It was not that you can get away with everything. It was, and it wasn't that you can't tell anybody that sin is sin. No, Paul's saying we're all under sin, Jew and Gentile. Okay? Um, we have proved that the Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. And as it is written, can't take this out of context, but as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Outside of Jesus Christ, there is nobody righteous. Paul was referring, now remember he taught, he made his argument against the Gentiles in chapter 1, made his argument against the Jews in chapter 2, he's, he's carried over into chapter 3, and he's saying, hey guys, it doesn't matter if you're, under the, if you're circumcised, if you're not circumcised, if you're the seed of Abraham, the natural, or if you're not the seed of Abraham, there's none righteous, no, not one. This is his argument. See, this is the problem when we, when we do, um, when you do a topical study, and I believe, I believe they're good, it's good to do topical studies. Study the subject of faith. Study the subject of grace. Study the subject of healing. Those are good studies to do. But make sure that when you're doing your studies, you keep scriptures within their setting yeah. in, in, in an expository manner or do a good exegesis of it. Break it down, study everything around it, so that when you read that scripture, you're not taking it out of its setting in a way that changes what it means. And people do that all the time. 
Okay? We have to be better Bible students than that. All of us. Okay? So when Paul goes, there's none righteous, no, not one. Now, see, now, if, you, if you're not careful, you get people come over here after you get born again, and some people say, well, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. And they go, no, you're a sinner. Paul said there's none righteous, no, not one. Wait, let's take it and put it back into its setting. Why was Paul saying that? Because he's, he's saying that the Jew and the Gentile are all under sin. Amen? They're all under sin. And so... The Jews don't get to boast, and the Gentiles don't get to boast. They're all under sin. There's, before you come to Jesus, there is none righteous, no, not one. No one, no, no, no single Jew is going to be able to make up and stand the ground. There's none righteous. Okay? And so within the context of what he's saying, because we do know that he writes to the church at Corneth. He's already written, actually, he's already written to the church at Corneth, which he's writing a letter from now, and said... If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away, behold, all things become new. For he who knew no sin was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he's already declared us righteous in a previous letter within the context of the new birth. Here he's saying, in the context of an argument <clears throat> to the Jews and the Gentiles, that outside of Jesus Christ, there are none righteous, no, not one. Okay. To make sure we, we, we keep things in the right place. Um, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeks after God. They're all gone out of the way. <coughs> they've all become together. Excuse me. Um, they've all come together, become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now Paul quotes. He quoted this from the Old Testament. And then he says this. Now we know that what things serve the law saith. It saith to them who are under the law. That every mouth may be stopped. And that all the world may become guilty before God. Why does the world have to become guilty before God? so that they can by faith receive the redemption he offers in Christ Jesus. And so Paul's quoting this, and again within the context of all the Jews and all the Gentiles are sinners. Amen. Not, you know, well, it makes people feel bad if you read that in church. No, they have to know where they are so they can get out of there. How many of you have ever gone into a hotel? And on the wall, our school, any, any public building, and on the wall, fire escape route. What's the first thing you find? You are here. Why? Because they just put that map up there and don't tell you where you are. You won't know how to get to where you need to be. Do so what? Escape. So they put here you are, or you are here, and then they draw a line to the exits. And that is what we, when we have to tell, when you come and tell people you're, you're lost without God, that's not being mean or judgmental or condemning. That is, you are here. Here's the route to get out. And we're doing, we're talking about Romans 9, so you know, if you're a good Southern Baptist, you know that you got to use the Romans roadmap. Amen. Isn't that right, Brother Bill? Amen. Amen. You got, when you preach, people get up and say, that's, that's a, it's a good, it's a good map. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to argue with it at all. I'm not Southern Baptist, but I'll tell you what, they're right. You've got to go through Romans. Romans is important. It's a good witnessing tool. Why? Because it shows you you're here. And then it goes on and shows you this is where you want to be. And then it tells you how to get there. Amen. Okay. Verse 8 19, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in sight, and by the law is the no and by the law is the knowledge of sin. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, what's he doing? He's telling you where to get out. Amen. Being freely joined, being justified freely by I'm sorry, being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth. To be a propitiation for our, uh, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Remember that word forbearance we read earlier. Same word. 
God withholding his wrath, withholding his anger, and, and, and giving you a leeway to repent and get right. To declare at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay. But by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision by faith. Do we make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. So Paul now points out back there a few verses and tells you where you are. Where do you, you want to get to be? Justified by faith. How do you get there? Through faith in Jesus Christ. So he begins to lay out the, the argument. Amen. And he's right, he's telling the Jews, guys, look, you're, you're guilty. The Gentiles are guilty. Everybody's guilty. Everybody's all by the, by the law of God. You're all found guilty. But the uncircumcised and the circumcised will both find their justification through faith in the blood of Jesus. The grace of God's at work in there. Amen. It is at work. You know, the grace of God's at work when you receive Jesus. There's a, it is a grace of God. Hallelujah. Can somebody say glory? glory. Hallelujah. Now, do we make the law void through faith? No. Yes. Paul says we establish the law. You got so many people trying to do away with the Old Testament. Same preacher that said that, you know, um, that if people judge, God, you tell you that God judges people are nations, they're sick, is also the one that said that, that um, if we could just get rid of the Old Testament, we wouldn't have any problems in the church. Well, Paul said we established the Old Testament through faith. The law is the Old Testament. We established it through walking by faith. That messes with people's heads. Well, how do we establish it? Well, because you're walking by faith and doing the things which are contained in the law by faith and not out of works, you're living in a relationship with Jesus Christ and you have a cleansing and you repent and you miss, miss the mark, you're, you're, God still believes. Listen, God did not change his mind. Adultery is still adultery. And it's still a sin. Amen. Murder is still murder and it's still a sin. That was not removed. Now, when Jesus said, remember, remember when the um, man came to Jesus and said, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And he said, well, what do you, how do you read the law? He said, well, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy strength, thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said, this is true. On this hinge, all the law and the prophets. He didn't say, on this we do away with all the law and the prophets. He said, this is what, if we walk in the, the law of love, then we, all the Old Testament, if you're walking in love, biblical love, not stupid stuff. And I don't even have to, I, I get tired of feeling like I've got to be the one that says all this, because everybody else gets to get away with it, I say it, they, they get big churches. I, that's, it bugs me. Because they, they'll, they'll let stuff go because they don't want to offend anybody. And people just flock in because they don't want to get offended. They never get judged, they never get challenged. The law of love doesn't mean get away with everything. Now, number one, if you're walking in love towards your brother, you won't desire or go after his wife. If you love your brother, biblically, truly love your brother, you won't envy his vehicle. If you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and strength, you won't want to take his name in vain. And you won't want to worship false idols because you love him. So Jesus said that all the law and the prophets hinge on that. Didn't say it did away with them. The secret to being able not to commit adultery is to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. So when the temptation of adultery comes, you go, no. Before you knew it was wrong, but you weren't empowered not to do it. Now there's a law working in you called the law of love that goes, you love your neighbor. And if you love him as Jesus loved him, you wouldn't hurt him by taking his wife from him. And if you love him as much as you, you wouldn't want somebody taking your wife from you. 
in most cases. That was a joke. Kind of like, I never saw that movie, Letters of Juliet. Or, you know, take him, take him. <laughs> you know, she's there, she's looking for, you know, uh, somebody Bartolini. Lorenzo Bartolini. Are you Lorenzo? I am Lorenzo Bartolini. And it's the wrong one. And so they're getting the car, get dried off, and the woman's at the window going, take him, take him. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're just joking. If you love God, if you love him, and he said, my name is holy, then if you really love God, you're not going to blaspheme his name. Be blasphemous about his name if you really love him. So on this hinge all the law and the prophets is not that you don't get to not, you don't get to go commit adultery because you're in the law of love. It's if you're really under the law of love, you're not going to do it because it's, it's still wrong. It's still a sin. It's just that the empowerment to live free from that sin is you love your neighbor more than you love yourself and your own desired satisfaction of having sex with someone else's wife. I'll just be real blunt. That your physical desires and lust. Do not supersede your love for your brother. Therefore, you're going to constrain your flesh because you love him and you don't want to hurt him. Amen. Now, Jesus got really pulled. He said, if you look on the lust after, you commit adultery already in your heart. And you don't need to be doing that either. You don't need to be having secretly wish you could be, you know, getting it on with, with your neighbor's wife. Hello? But you... I hear henceforth forbid Nathan to ever do that song again at anybody's wedding. <laughs> just, I'm just teasing. Hallelujah. I'm sure he's going to get Shannon at some point in time. So we, we, we don't do away with the law because we're under the law of love and the law of faith. We're we'll living by faith. They're established. And they're established in our ability to walk that out by faith because of what's on the inside of us. But you still got to walk it out. Now I started to say this on Sunday, and I got sidetracked, so I never got to it. But this, discuss, this discussion with this person had, had profound effect on me. The thing that people are that stupid. Because I'm bound to grace, I don't have to go to church, I don't have to tithe, I don't have to give, I don't have to obey, I don't have to submit. And they just listed a litany of stuff they don't have to do. So I sent back. When the Bible says, obey those with the rule of you, submit yourself to one another, it says, for the sake not the assembling of yourselves together, it says, you know, that he, 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 he received the tithe, Hebrews, right now. And I went on and guessed all her litany, what she didn't have to. I gave her New Testament scriptures that said, do it. She didn't like that. So I had more further discussion with this person. And uh, I said, you know, God told Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He, he told them not to. You know what this person told me? They didn't have the Holy Ghost like we do. I think at this point I gave up. I didn't tell them. I thought it. I thought, lady, you just can't fix stupid. You're so blinded by your a mission to propagate a, a theological viewpoint at the expense of all other scriptures, there's no helping you until you get out of that, until, you, you know, until you're willing to accept other. Adam and Eve didn't have the Holy Ghost like we did. They were, they were created with the very breath of God. Who do you think the breath of God is? The Holy Ghost. Same word. The Hebrew word and the New Testament Greek word for wind, pneuma for the Greek, I don't know what it is for the, for the Hebrew, but they're equivalent. They, they carry the same meaning. Breath, wind, spirit. God, it says God breathed into man the breath of life, or he took out of his spirit and put in there. Adam was created with the very spirit of God, sinless. Not, not needing to be redeemed, sinless. 
it, it's, it's real, sin isn't the right word. He was created absent from sin or even the knowledge of sin. Yet God told him, gave him a command. So what the pr people say is, there's no, he, there's no commands of the New Testament but to walk in love. That's the only command we have is to walk in love. And we're in the grace. Yet Paul writes and tells us that the law has not been done away with. It's been established by the life of faith. I live out by faith overcoming my flesh. And you do too. And if you're not, you better because you're going to fail. Hello? I wonder how the God who says, be holy for I am holy, enjoys his people living unholy. I wonder how the God who said, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing handles. We can shoot up and we can smoke dope and we can drink and get high and drunk and all this kind of stuff because we're under grace. And he says, he said, don't be like them. Well, I'm trying to win the world. He said, come out from among them and be separate. Jesus went and ate with them. He went to minister to them. He did not go to fellowship. How do you know? Because every time pressure came, he went to, they all got together. He withdrew himself and went off to pray. He did not, you don't see him praying with the publicans and sinners. He's there ministering to them. He's there as a minister. It's a ministry opportunity. Not a hangout time. Your friends and your fellowship needs to be with Christians. I know somebody, somebody used to be in our church years ago. Loved to hang out with their old friends. You can't, hang, and I'm not talking about Christian friends. I'm talking about sinners. Right. I'm talking about people who want to go to the bars and hang out. You don't need to go and hang out at bars. Amen. Can I get three amens? Amen. That's different if, you know, if God says, go in there and witness to so-and-so on the third seat down there. But don't you make that your regular drop-off every day. That's right. I was at a, I don't even like going to bars, even when I go pick up takeout food. Right. You know, if you, go, if you order takeout at hands, you got to go to the bar to pick it up. Uh, and um, the other week I went over there, and see, I sat at the bar, and oh, okay, I hate going to the bar. I just don't like the atmosphere around the bar. I just don't like the spiritual atmosphere. So I'm standing there, I'm in my suits after church. This guy walks in and goes, who are you? You're like somebody important. <laughs> has a slit. Uh, I think he has slits. Yeah. I think, uh, uh, it's either slits or Colt 45. I can't remember which one was holding. You know. And uh, I said, I'm a pastor. Really? Well, you, I thought you looked like somebody important. Uh, you went in churches that like Baptists, that's what I'm just quoting what he said now, because Pentecostals don't, and don't, don't believe in it either. You know, they don't believe in drinking either. They, they, they says it's wrong to drink. I said, well, we just believe we got something better. Yeah. He went, oh, okay, where's the church? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? Know, yeah. Well, see, I, might come, I said, come on, come visit us. We'd love to have you. Amen. Now, see, I'm, a, I'm not going to sit there and drink a cold wind with it to get it to come to Jesus. He's already recognized there's something different about me. I was important. He just thought I was important. Well, I am. I'm doing important business. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the business of, of getting the gospel to people. So, I'm, I'm expecting him to come showing up one day. Gave my website. You can get directions there, buddy. <laughs> but Jesus didn't go and hang out with the publicans and sinners to just hang and fellowship. That was, that was a ministry place. So make sure you keep, your, you keep your, your circle of influence in your life. See, the sinners shouldn't be influenced in your life. Right. Amen. They're ministry opportunities. 
your Christian friends who love the Lord, walk in the Word, those that, that is a circle of influence you want to be around when you're fellowshipping. Right. Right. You can let your guard down a little bit more in the sense that uh, you can say certain things you wouldn't want to say in front of a sinner because they don't get it. They just need to know you're lost without God, without hope in this world, you need Jesus, that Jesus fixed me, he can fix you. If he can fix me, he can fix anybody. Amen. You're easy compared. If he, if he can fix me, yeah. you're easy. Yeah. <laughs> if I was a mess, you're easy. See, so when we do this, um, but I've, I've seen too many people in the past, and I, have, and I have some stories, and I told the one not that long ago about the guy that used to be in our church at home who started hanging around some people, and then in that hanging around, they, they weren't Christians, they were old friends. He started wanting to smoke dope again. Drink. Do some crack. Went to jail. Lost his wife. Lost his whole family. Was a minister at our church. Lost everything. And from what I understand, he, he repented and got his heart right with God. But in the process of time, he lost everything. Right. Now, I said all that. This wasn't a get you on you who you hang out with thing. It was to show you that Jesus was not there for buddy time. <laughs> Jesus was there for ministry time, and there's a big difference. Hello. I say hello. Now, let me say this on Facebook. I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of my friends that I went to high school with, I don't go hang out with them. Now, one of them was here, you know, and, um, and he, he's a Christian now, but um, was here a couple of years ago. We went and had Starbucks together, and I would go do the same thing, yeah. you know. But I'll tell you what, when, they eat, when, they, when they're in a desperate time or whatever, I'll, I'll send prayers. I'll write prayers. I, I send that message usually in the background. I don't send it. I have sent them up front because, you know, it was too much for her to get into the message thing or whatever. But the, or somebody put something on their Facebook that was like unbelief. Right. You try to help them. So I've had them, you know. They're, they're talking about drinking one minute and doing this next minute. And they thank you, Eddie, for the, for the prayers. That was, that was awesome. I just appreciate that. That was awesome. <laughs> You know, because you gave them the word. So now, a lot of this is, is Facebook opportunities or opportunities to minister. Love the people. You know, a lot of them you know, I hadn't seen them since we graduated 30 years ago. Yeah. 38. I graduated 38 years ago from high school. Some of these guys, now look, if we were somewhere and I went to a restaurant, they were sitting, I'd go sit down with them and eat with them and hang out. But you know what? Some of them, I love them. I want them to go to heaven. But I ain't going to plan, plan a week-long vacation at a condo with them. I can tell you that. <laughs> and then I'm going to have to hide every time the beer cans are put up on a picture. <laughs> Who's the guy in the background? The undone classmate. <laughs> do, 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 remember Gene Gene, the dancing machine? Do, 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 do. How many ever saw the gong show? Uh, yeah. All right. Then you had the unknown comic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Gene Gene, the dancing machine? I don't want to be the unknown pastor, but, you know, you know some things you just wouldn't go do because they're not, they're, I'm there to be a ministry, not a fellowship time. Now, who do I fellowship with? You guys. I'll go fellowship with y'all anytime. I'll go out and eat with you anytime. Don't know if I'm going to stay in a condo with you. You might snore. But I can tell you ahead of time, I do. <laughs> Just got tossed right there off the camera. Phew. <laughs> we hereby make the announcement that Cap is suspended for the rest of the season. <laughs> now we live a life of faith. We live a fight life. In that life of faith, we fulfill the law and establish the law. We do not do away with the law. We maintain our position as ministries as ministers of the gospel. We all, every one of you, Jeff and Melanie and Montria and Karen and Bill and Dick and the guy who just got tossed and Ben <laughs> and Ellie and Belinda, Cap. Cap no longer gets the title of the attachment. We've got a new one. Hallelujah. We've all been given the ministry of reconciliation. So we all have a ministry. Go get people reconciled to God. Amen. I said amen. amen. Hallelujah. So praise the Lord. We, we're going we're gonna to do that. We're going to walk in the love of God, establish the law, we recognize that we're all under sin outside of Jesus Christ. But in Jesus Christ, you're no longer under all the things that Paul said. How many, how many seek the Lord?
So that passage says, none, there's none that seeketh God, there's not one. None that doeth good. I've been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So that passage can't be talking about the post-recreated spirit. It's talking about the Jew and the Gentile before Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to pick up here next week in Romans chapter 4. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.